Michael? Can, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, very good. Um, right, it's a great pleasure to be taking part in this very unusual meeting um, at this pretty awful time for the world. Um, I'm going to talk about some recent work that I've done in collaboration with uh, a variety of people. Um, and it will be in two parts, my talk. The, the basic aim is to make a, um, a, a detailed c comparison of the um, structure of correlation functions in n equals four line mills um, and their holographic image by looking at the, um, the large n expansion of the correlation function and the low energy expansion of the dual string theory um, in ADS5. Um, and this is really a, 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 in the spirit of um, a significant amount of work which has been done by various groups on trying to make contact between the uh, four-dimensional Yang Mills and the flat space limit of um, the ADS, uh, in this case, ADS5 cross S5 um, string theory. Um, so the first part of the talk will be setting the, uh, giving the background in string theory for what in the second half of the talk will be um, what the, uh, the aim will be to reproduce this from, from uh, the conformal field theory. Uh, I've listed here a number of people who have, I've worked with in the past, but most recently um, with Kong Ka Wen um, at Queen Mary, who has been a collaborator on this, both the first and second half of this, this talk. Um, so um, the idea is to, in the first half of the talk, to review um, some of the features of the low energy expansion in string theory and what we know about the exact um, coefficients in the low energy expansion. And in the second half, to talk about um, the um, obtaining these coefficients by and, and their ADS generalizations by um, using the techniques that were pioneered actually by this group of people here um, in a beautiful series of papers. So these are my other collaborators, Shai Chester, Sylvia Pufu, and Yifan Wang. Um, and really we've joined in recently in trying to get a more, not, uh, trying to understand the non-perturbative features of this, these connections. So let me begin by just a quick review of the connections between the low energy expansion and, and holography. So the lowest order um, in the low energy expansion, one has the stringy version of the Einstein-Hilbert term, which involves the dilaton field in particular, which when it's constant is one over the coupling constant, e to the minus phi is one over the string coupling. Um, alpha prime as usual will be the square of the string length. This translates, if you use the holographic dictionary, um, into a term proportional to n squared in my normalization, um, and with no dependence on the coupling constant. This is the, this is the, um, the uh, supergravity, obviously the supergravity um, uh, part of the action. Um, and th th that involves the uh, curvature scalar R. Um, and now, now there are, of course, in string theory, there are higher order terms. Um, this first term is order one over alpha prime to the fourth. The first correction in the theory I'm going to talk about, in type 2b, maximally supersymmetric string theory, the first correction is order r to the fourth, which is six derivatives higher, and therefore three powers of alpha prime higher, um, and it's of order one over alpha prime, and there's a factor of g to the minus a half which comes in if, if one expresses in, in, in transforming from the string frame to the Einstein frame. So this curly E is a curve, curly E is the coefficient of R to the fourth, which is a function in general of the um, uh, moduli fields, um, although in this case there will be a single modulus in the type 2b theory. Um, and um, the, um, and this factor of g to the minus a half um, matches with the with alpha prime in transforming when one when one when one looks at the holographic trend, uh, interpretation 
um, that transforms into a factor of n to the half. <coughs> so um, more generally, I've written um, higher order derivatives, d to the 2n r to the fourth, have higher powers of g and higher powers of alpha prime, and that translates into a coefficient which behaves, which, which is n to the half minus little n over two. So that the number of, the dimension of the um, interaction is correlated with the power of n. Um, this, uh, so I'm gonna be interested in a limit in which n goes to infinity, but the uh, coupling constant, the Young-Mills coupling is gonna be fixed. So this is not the Toft limit, and I'll say more about this in the end. Um, but th this is the limit in which the duality symmetry of the um, of the um, uh, correspondence will be manifest. So in this limit, the alpha prime expansion is a power series in one over n to the half. Um, so let me say more about the string scattering amplitudes. Um, so the string scattering amplitude in this very supersymmetric theory has a factor of r to the fourth out front, multiplying a scalar function of the Mandelstam variables, and it's a function of the, um, of the uh, co complex coupling constant tau. Um, and um, so th this function t is a symmetric function of the Mandelstam invariance. And as, as far as this talk is concerned, it can be taken to be analytic of course, it isn't really analytic because there are branch cuts. There are, there's a profusion of branch cuts, but they won't enter into the lower or lowest order terms I'm going to be talking about. So it's an analytic function of st and u with the constraint that s plus t plus u vanishes, which in fact means that it um, is only a function. It, it's, it's, it can be expanded in a power series in these two quantities, s squared plus t squared plus u squared and s cubed plus t cubed plus u cubed. So t, uh, the, uh, the, the scalar factor in the scattering amplitude is a power series indexed by P and Q, uh, power series in sigma two and sigma three, and the coefficients um, are functions of the coupling constant. And indeed, uh, since we want to discuss, since, since we want the amplitude to be invariant under SL2Z, the type 2B theory, that's the duality symmetry, um, these coefficients have to be SL2Z invariant functions, modular functions. Um, SL2 acts on the um, on tau in the usual way that I've, I've written on the left here. Um, and one of the aims would be to determine these coefficients and to understand how they're constrained by symmetries in particular. Um, in order to understand that and to make sure one has the right expressions, um, it's important to understand their limit in the in in the proto in, in string perturbation theory. That's the limit in which the um, the parameter tau two, the imaginary part of tau, goes to infinity. So let me very briefly review what is known about that. Um, well, in, since ancient days, we've known that the tree level amplitude um, can be written in terms of something close to the original Virasoro amplitude, which is very familiar to most of you. Um, and that can be expanded in a power series in ST and U um, by using some simple identities for ratios of gamma functions. And I've written the first few terms of that expansion here, just to illustrate the fact that um, these, this is a power series in sigma three and sigma two, um, where the coefficients are rational numbers times Riemann times powers in general of the Riemann zeta values. And these coefficients, um, these, these successive terms are higher and higher, to, correspond to higher and higher ordered derivatives in the, um, in the low energy expansion. So it starts with a term, which in fact is the classical supergravity term, followed by the first correction, which is of order alpha prime cubed, as I said before. Um, and corresponds to an r to the fourth interaction. And then all the higher order terms correspond to higher derivatives on r to the fourth. Um, and the general feature is that, as I said, these are the coefficients are odd Riemann zeta values or powers of odd Riemann zeta values with rational coefficients. Um, more generally, there's been a lot of understanding of how this fits in with uh, how the, the um, 
n particle scattering amplitudes um, generalize this. Um, and um, in particular, the last speaker, um, Sir Fan Stieberger, and his collaborators um, understood how the coefficients of the endpoint functions are given by rational coefficients times multiple zeta values. So there's a very interesting mathematical structure simply in the, in the tree level diagrams, which corresponds to um, the kinds of issues that arise in um, understanding loop amplitudes in quantum field theory. Um, let me go on to talk about genus one. Um, genus one um, is um, more difficult to expand, but it, when, one can, one can um, expand the, um, one can look at the low energy expansion of the four point function and the first two terms, which I've written here, um, are given by these values. Um, again, the coefficients of rational numbers times products of zeta values. Um, actually, I should have, the zeta two is a red herring. There's a factor of pi squared multiplying the whole thing. And then the, um, the remaining coefficients are odd, are again, powers of odd zeta values. Um, there's a lot, there's interesting, um, structure here, which, which, I've, which I haven't illustrated, because I've written the integrated amplitude, the uh, integrated over the modulus of the torus, the, um, the function that you're integrating, it, the class of functions that one integrates are interesting functions in their own right. They are elliptical generalizations of polylogs um, and therefore multiple zeta values, um, but I'm, that's not the subject of this talk. Um, and of course, at genus one and above, one at some point pretty soon meets um, non-analytic terms corresponding to uh, threshold. So it's, it's more difficult to understand the structure of the higher order terms. But at low orders, the terms that I've written are the ones which arise. Um, at genus two, more difficult still to write down the low energy expansion, but the first couple of terms are known, the ones I've written. And um, a genus three, virtually nothing is known apart from the leading term, which is the one I've written down here. <clears throat> um, and I've written these down because these are the terms which one wants to match um, later on when one talks about fitting the data from the point of view of the holographic, holographically related uh, Yang-Mills uh, correlation functions. And these, these terms that I've written down are the ones which, in, which are protected in some sense. They're BPS uh, protected terms. They're, um, R to the fourth is a half BPS, D to the fourth, R to the fourth is a quarter BPS, and D to the sixth, R to the fourth is an eighth BPS. Um, so those are perturbative terms, um, and um, they fit into a non-perturbative story, um, which I will now summarize equally quickly. Um, remember that the amplitude is given in terms of this scalar function of tau where the coefficients are SL2 Z invariant functions and using a combination of detective work and um, supersymmetry and some aspects of duality one can pin down the first few coefficients in this in the low energy expansion rather precisely uh, so the r to the fourth coefficient for example um, is determined to be a function which satisfies the Laplace eigenvalue equation on a Laplace eigen, where the Laplacian is on the hyperbolic plane and um, the um, eigenvalue is three quarters for r to the fourth and the eigenvalue for d to the fourth r to the fourth is 15 quarters. So these are very simple beautiful equations that follow essentially from supersymmetry together with the assumption of duality invariance. Um, and the solutions of these equations, equations of this form, Laplace eigenvalue equations, are non-holomorphic Eisenstein series, um, which I won't say very much about, other than reminding you about their definition, which is given here. So they're double sums over integers m and n, and they are sort of the non-holomorphic ver versions of perhaps the more familiar holomorphic Eisenstein series. They are SL2Z invariant, and they solve indeed Laplace equations precisely of the type that I, I, I mentioned on the previous slide. <clears throat> and um, 
and so the first uh, the r to the fourth coefficient is the Eisenstein series e three halves. That is known to have an expansion which involves a zero mode, which has precisely two power behaved terms. Um, and I've normalized it by taking out the factor g to the minus a half, which you need to have when you want to go to the string frame to describe the string amplitude. Um, so the first two terms are in fact um, power behaved in the string coupling and therefore should correspond to string perturbation theory. And then there's an infinite set of what are in fact instanton terms. They have, um, they are um, non-zero modes with respect to tau one. So you see it's straight just from this equation, from this solution, that um, the r to the fourth coefficient is not renormalized beyond one loop. Um, that's the half PPS case. The quarter PPS case is a similar story. The eigenvalue is five halves. And this time there is a two loop term. There isn't actually a one loop term, it vanishes. Um, and that's the statement that the uh, d to the fourth r to the fourth is not normalized beyond two loops. And then there's an interesting infinite set of instant con um, contributions again with a rather precisely defined um, coefficient. The next term, which is the last of the BPS protected terms of order d to the sixth r to the fourth, satisfies a, a more a richer equation because now it's at a plus eigenvalue equation, which has an inhomogeneous term on the right hand side, which is simply the square of the Eisenstein series e three halves, and that can be solved, um, and it is. Um, its solution is rather interesting, and one of the interesting features is that the zero mode is, 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 is much richer than it was for the Eisenstein series, because there are now four power by behave terms going, corresponded to going from genus zero to genus three. And then there's, in addition to that, an infinite set of instanton anti-instanton pairs. So that's just in the, um, the zero mode part of the solution. These power behave terms, you, you can compare with the terms I showed you earlier in which came from direct string perturbation theory calculations and they correspond precisely and they have exactly the same values. So that there is um, um, an understanding of where these coefficients come at this level from um, supersymmetry. Um, th in this case, there's no, th th these, um, the sixth part of the fourth is not renormalized beyond three loops. Um, I since time will be short, I will flip through this next discussion, which is that all this, everything I've talked about can be generalized in various ways. One way is that um, there is in string theory, but not in supergravity, there are amplitudes which violate the U1 symmetry, um, which um, is um, associated with the fact that the duality group is SL2Z to discrete duality group, not a continuous one. And um, although the four point functions that I'm discussing conserve the U1, endpoint functions in general violate the U1 and they violate it by, by up to uh, two N minus four, twice N minus four units. So the five point function violates it by up to two units and so on. And there's an interesting story there. The, um, the, um, an example of an endpoint function where you have four gravitons and M um, complex dilatons, um, for example, will violate the, um, since the dilaton carries two units of charge, it will violate um, the U1 by 2M units. And these Eisenstein series that I had earlier, or these modular functions I had earlier, are now modular forms because they have to transform in a way which, which compensates for the violation of the U1. Um, and it, we, we understand how to construct these modular forms by taking covariant de derivatives on, for example, on the Eisenstein series um, in order to extract the coefficient of the term involving the lowest order term of the form r to the fourth times z to the m. Um, and this is the work that I've done with, uh, last year with Kong Kao Wen. Um, let me now move on to the second part of the talk. <clears throat> I apologize for being so rushed, but then that's the way this 
that, that conferences go. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the connection with the Montan and Olive duality um, of correlation functions in N equals four young mills. And this will be truly sketchy. There's an awful lot of background here. Background mostly due to my collaborator's <coughs> previous work. Um, so we're going to consider now the correlation function of four superconformal primaries, which um, are dual to the graviton. Um, and in particular, let's talk about the 20 prime operator. Um, the, um, and the, the way this, these arguments go, you, you're, we're going to start by thinking of the partition function for the n equals two star theory on S4. This is the partition function first considered by Peston um, about 12 years ago, I think. Um, and which is, which, um, as I'm sure most of you know, is a great example of supersymmetric localization. So you can, it can be determined exactly by using supersymmetric localization. And it can be written as a product of uh, three factors. Um, a classical part, a one loop part, and an instanton part, where the instanton part is, is, is built out of the Nekrasov partition function. Um, and what we're going to do, what my collaborators did, was understand how to make a supersymmetric correlation function in n equals four Yang Mills theory, starting with this n equals two star partition function and taking a, a massless limit. The n equals four theory. You can think of the two, n equals two star theory as a mass deformed, um, a mass deformation of the n equals four theory. Um, and then in the massless limit, you recover the n equals four theory. <coughs> the n equals four partition function um, uh, is sort of trivial. Whereas the, what well, we're not interested in the partition function, we're interested in the four uh, point correlation function and that's obtained, as these people that are referred to, Binder, Chester, Pufu, and Wang showed in a very beautiful paper, um, that correlation function is obtained by taking derivatives with respect to the mass, two derivatives with respect to the mass, and the derivatives with respect to the coupling constant, tau and tau bar. Um, and that is a, that will give a supersymmetric expression but it will it will give a correlation function but it will, it's an integrated correlation function it's the fact that it's integrated that is associated with the fact that it preserves supersymmetry but the fact that it's integrated of course means that it also is liable to lose information <coughs> um, compared to the unintegrated correlation function um, and then there's a whole story about how you approach the flat space limit, um, starting, I think, with the work of Panadonis and Polchinski and others. Um, and, um, and if one's interested in the perturbative part, if, so these people looked at the perturbative part of the um, correlation function, which is obtained by um, taking the first two factors in the Pestrin partition function. And there are lots of technical issues, which I won't go into, to do with how you, that it, this starts on S4, but you really want the answer on R4. Um, and so there's some transformation there. And then there's the technical questions of how you take the large radius limit, the flat space limit, um, which involves the Manning transform and many other issues, which I'm not going to go into. Um, but let, I, what I want to emphasize is, is so the, the, the work of this paper by Binder, Chester, Buffer, and Wang um, concentrated on the perturbative um, part, um, in particular, the tree level amplitude um, in string theory, um, in the string theory language, the limit in which you recover the expansion of the tree level amplitude in powers of um, the, um, in, in the um, large end limit. Um, and the method uses, as I said, a localization, which involves integrate, you end up with an expression which is an integral over um, the, um, a, const, the, a constant mode of the scalar field on the sphere, um, where um, there are n 
so an n n fold integral n minus one fold integral over the um, essentially the elements of the Cartan um, algebra of the um, on the sphere. Um, so this is this expression is rather complicated. I certainly haven't got time to go into it, but let me just say that the big the factor involving this function h um, is important in particular in obtaining the perturbative result, and the factor involving the Nekrasov partition function is the new part um, of what we did, where we want it because in order to understand the SL two invariance of the result, you need to understand how the instantons come in. So the, I, the, um, the, the I, let me just make a comment about that. In the usual truth limit, um, the instantons are suppressed. Um, and if you just simply look at the leading term in the truth limit, you get the supergravity result. And then you get, um, um, if you now look at the expansion in powers of one over lambda, where lambda is the tuft coupling, then you, then you can recover the uh, tree level results by looking at all orders in lambda for the term of order n squared <clears throat> in that limit. But as I said, that suppresses the instantons and doesn't um, keep the SL2 invariance manifest. Um, if you want to preserve the SL2 invariance or the S-duality, then you have to look at a, 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 a sort of a much, a, a limit which is in fact an ultra strong coupling limit where n goes to infinity with g fixed so that the truth coupling is going to infinity um, and um, and then what you want to get is the expression i had i showed earlier at least for the r to the fourth term you want this term which begins with n to the half um, and has an eisenstein series e three halves <coughs> which has two uh, symbolically I, i've written I haven't written the precise coefficients, but the, it's got two power behaved terms um, corresponding to what I said was string tree level and one loop. And then there's an infinite set of terms, which were the instanton terms. <coughs> um, when I called them instantons, I was, um, I didn't explain perhaps that the, they involve the sum of Bessel functions times the phases. The Bessel function, of course, at weak coupling when G Yang Mills goes to zero, the um, Bessel function has an asymptotic behavior, which is e to the minus eight pi squared over G squared, um, which is an instanton exponential suppression. But there are an infinite set of powers of G Yang Mills. So there is the, the each instanton, each value of K um, comes with an infinite set of, of a precisely defined infinite set of Corrections, and all this we were we, we expect to get by looking at the um, the instanton part would come from the Nekrasov partition function. So the Nekrasov partition function has a Fourier can be written as a Fourier sum with um, uh, over the instanton number k, and these individual for any fixed k. We um, we that we would um, uh, want to take the derivative. As I said earlier, the correlation function is is, is obtained by taking derivatives um, with respect to the mass first, and then with respect to coupling constant of the um, the log of of z. Um, so that's what one wants to consider. Um, the result in general. For, these, for this, this, this object, Zk, which is the, uh, the um, thing we want to calculate, is very complicated. It involves multiple integrals, which have to be uh, thought about carefully um, because the contours um, uh, enclose poles in a complicated manner, which I certainly am not going to go into. Let me simply say that even for k equals 1, the 1 instanton is already a bit of a challenge, but the 1 instanton 1 can work out what the answer is. And indeed, one gets this Bessel function, um, which is uh, the, uh, the one instant on part of the, uh, of the Eisenstein series, E three halves. Um, uh, but the K instant on term is much more difficult to analyze. Um, after a lot of discussion and uh, sort of technical 
complications, one can, for, for any k that one chooses, one can verify that it, it indeed reproduces the factor that one wants, which is this factor, which again involves a, the Bessel function k1, but with a divisor sum sigma2, um, which is quite subtle. Um, and the counting, the, the process of, of obtaining this involves uh, analyzing young, young diagrams that have come up by analyzing that bottom integral on this transparency. But, it, um, but although one can do that for any k given enough effort, we didn't, we didn't actually have a general proof for all k, um, but it, we have a, a, a very well tested conjecture up to a very large value of k. <clears throat> um, and so this gives, this gives a um, result which um, in fact generalizes or extends the old results. So there was an old calculation, a very beautiful calculation by Dory, Cozy, Mattis and Hollywood in the late 1990s, who looked from a diff completely different perspective. They evaluated, they used the ADHM construction to evaluate the um, instant on measure um, for large N SUN Yang mills, um, but they, and they looked at leading order in the coupling constant expansion. <coughs> um, the result I'm now quoting sort of extends that in a sense because it, um, it's not just a leading order in G Yang mills, but it's in all orders in G Yang mills, getting the whole, all the terms in that Bessel function. Um, what it, where, whereas the Dory, Cozy, Mattis, and Hollywood expression uh, method um, explained that um, sigma two, the, the divisor sum in a very, in a very um, beautiful way, the divisor sum came out as a uh, partition function of the D instant on matrix model. Um, there isn't, as far as I can see, we don't have a, a really clear understanding of that um, from this perspective. So I think that's a bit of a gap. Um, let me go ahead though, um, by listing a few results. So the leading term, so let me, let me now summarize the results of what we did. The, the leading term, of course, reproduces supergravity amplitude. There are no instantons. The next term, as I just said, reproduces the E3 halves. The term after that reproduces the D to the fourth, R to the fourth. Um, but it actually, because we're talking about integrated co correlation functions, um, it can't, this method doesn't separate the D to the fourth, R to the fourth term, which is the flat space result, from a term that you would get if you compactified from flat space on ADS5, where you would get a term where instead of d to the fourth r to the fourth, you get a one over l to the fourth, where l is the scale of the ADS. So those two terms come together. Um, and in order, to, uh, they come together to make a single coefficient. In order to separate them, one has to, um, at this point, one would um, uh, compare with, um, the flat space result, where there was some coefficient modifying E5 halves, um, D to the fourth out of the fourth, and then using the flat space result, one could figure out what the, what the anti decider space correction was, what the term of order alpha prime over L to the fourth was. So this gives more information about string theory in ADS5 by combining the flat space result with, the, um, with this correlation function. So, here is the, um, what we believe is the all orders, well, it's the first few terms of an all orders expansion. And it's a very striking looking expression. It's an expression in which the, um, the correlation function we're talking about has an expansion where every term, expansion in one over n to the half, in odd powers of one over n to the half, where every term is given by a sum of Eisenstein series with particular coefficients <clears throat> um, and um, particular index values. So that's a, a rather strikingly um, uh, beautiful way of seeing how um, the expression is um, well, manifestly invariant under SL2. Um, each term here would correspond to a sum of terms in 
each line would correspond to a sum of terms in the effective action and string theory. But as I said, you can't separate on each line the terms I've listed um, have coefficients that can't be separated from each other without more information from flat space or from some other um, place. So the first line is R to the fourth. The second line is the one I mentioned earlier, which involves D to the fourth, R to the fourth, and one over L to the fourth, R to the fourth, and so on. These are only, this is only part of the story though, because there must be terms of order one over N, for example, there must be terms with even, powers of one over n to the half. Um, and indeed, in a recent paper by two of my collaborators, uh, Chester and Pufu, they pointed out that there's a different correlation function one can use, where instead of taking two derivatives with respect to the mass, you take four derivatives with respect to the mass. This defines a independent four-point correlation function, which is again an integrated correlation function. It's distinct from the first one because the measure that you integrate over is a different measure. So it gives other sort of information. And they looked at the um, uh, perturbative part of the expression you get from this. And, and we have been looking, and this is not yet finished work, but we've been looking at um, the instanton part again. And we noticed that the, you can group together the terms that you get in generalizations, which involve, for example, this function E01, um, which is the coefficient of d to the sixth r to the fourth, um, that comes up and you hit, it, you hit it on the nose. So that was the last, you know, the one eighth BPS piece term I mentioned earlier in my talk. Uh, again, there are ambiguity, there are, in ADS5, there are, it come, they come, d to the sixth r to the fourth comes hand in hand with these other terms, one over L squared d to the fourth r to the fourth, one over L sixth r to the fourth. So you need more information than uh, to extract it. Um, so far, I've said we've got two kinds of correlation functions. The one I was talking about on the previous transparencies and this one, um, you need a third piece of information in order to get each of these coefficients properly. Um, but in a minute, I will mention what that is. Um, but when you go beyond d to the sixth r to the fourth, you get more and more um, terms that contribute, and it's not clear that you will be able to get them. There's no procedure that we know of to um, isolate each of the terms individually. Um, when I said that there were, we do know that there are, there's a third bit of information you can get, it's because there's a third correlation function that you can calculate, which involves not just derivatives with respect to the mass and derivatives, um, not just two derivatives with respect to the mass and four derivatives with respect to the mass, but also derivatives with respect to the parameter that describes the shape of the sphere, the S4 can be squashed, and you can take a derivative with respect to the squashing parameter. And um, that defines another integrated, independent in integrated correlation function, which in principle will give more information, although as yet uh, that hasn't been used. Um, but the fact is that there are three independent co four-point correlators that one can define, and one needs up to three independent um, bits of information to determine the coefficients of all the BPS protected terms, all the terms up to d to the sixth r to the fourth. So it looks like one can do that without inputting anything from the flat space string theory that we, we that is what we'd like to predict. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, let me simply end with the statement that um, th there is a lot of information here beyond uh, the BPS protected um, interactions, even though we don't know how to isolate them individually, we, we know something about them which um, lends some hope to um, the idea that one might understand these um, terms from the point of, from the holographic point of view as well as simply by looking at string perturbation theory thank you okay thank you michael um so let's see we have a question from lance 
Hi, Michael. Very nice talk. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, so uh, I was curious whether you have enough information to maybe try to make some numerical contact with Yang Mills perturbation theory for these correlators. In other words, you're coming in from strong Yang Mills coupling, and maybe you can calculate a weak coupling for a few loops and, and try to match. Or do you think the radius of convergence won't be good enough to do that on one side okay. or the other? It's a very interesting question. There, there is a, something which I certainly didn't talk about. The, the work by, um, by the group uh, that I mentioned, Binder, Pufu, um, Chester, and Wang, um, that came up with a, an exact formula for the large, uh, based on the large lambda um, perturbative terms, um, which in fact, when you continue to small lambda has some rather um, um, close connection with perturbative Yang Mills. So um, I, I mean, I, I, I don't really know what the complete answer to your question is, but, um, but it's, um, it's conceivable that there is one, one can uh, understand things that way. Um, maybe I can comment on that. Uh, uh, indeed, as Michael said, uh, the formula is also valid for small lambda. So in fact, uh, one can check, uh, agree with uh, people computing the using uh, Feynman diagrams. Okay, thanks. Is that Concow? It's me, yes. Yeah, thanks. I should say my collaborators are probably in the audience and they, can, they should feel very free to make comments. Um, okay, uh, Oliver, uh, brief question. Hi, Michael. Hi. Yeah, it's very interesting that you have this window into the coefficients of d to the 8, r to the 4th, and beyond. And suppose uh, I'm just interested in small instanton numbers and in the Fourier zero mode. Could it be more realistic to get uh, exact answers at uh, small instanton numbers? Well, there, there is this problem that what you, we're calculating the integrated correlation function, which mixes up to different terms in the, um, in the ADS um, uh, action. Um, so I, uh, beyond d to the sixth r to the fourth, I don't, I don't think we, and I, I don't think we really know how to separate those terms. Um, I, 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 by the way, I should say that I didn't, uh, Say so there's a statement on this last transparency where these functions e naught one e well, e naught one you're familiar with e one one and e um, two one satisfy very interesting um, generalizations of the inhomogeneous Laplace equations that I haven't I didn't think I had time to to write down but and haven't yet appeared but we will we'll be there's there will be a paper eventually on this um, very nice. Okay, um, last question, Nima. Uh, Michael, uh, this is just a, a very simple question. You, you may have uh, uh, explained it and, and I missed it, but uh, um, this business about these being uh, uh, integrated correlation functions. Uh, so there, there's no uh, S and T on the side of the, of, of the uh, partition function calculation, no sigma two and sigma three in your uh, notation. Right. So do you know, um, but do you know, like uh, for any one of these objects that you're talking, for any one of these uh, uh, derivatives of partition functions, do you know precisely which combination of the sigma two and sigma threes that show up at any given order are being, uh, are being computed? No, I think that's the, the point I was trying to make that we know that this, we know in some sense, a, a sum of terms, but separating them into different terms. Well, but that, that's, that's what I was asking. I mean, I, 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 of course, I understand that since, since you, don't, you only have one thing on the left-hand side, you're not going to see all the different, uh, all the, you're not going to be able to break it up into the different sigma right. two, sigma three dependencies. I was just wondering if, if you do know which combination of the sigma two, sigma three coefficients are being determined by the well, calculation actually, on the left-hand okay. side. I mean, I, I, I think Silvio is in the audience. Um, he, are you there, Silvio? Yes, I am. I can I can I can answer that. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. We we know precisely which combination, but uh, you know it's a combination in the um, CFT four point function, 
Um, so that contains more information than just the flat space scattering amplitude. Sure. So, it's, okay. so it's not okay. just the flat space scattering amplitude. I, but I, but, okay. but yeah, we, we, we do know precisely which coefficients of the position, de you know, each, each thing gets multiple, comes with a position right. dependence. Okay. And Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Okay, well, thank you, Michael, again. Um,